Uh, welcome everyone to another uh, Inspirage Unscripted video. My name is Ty McCrossan and I'm a Senior Solution Director here at Inspirage. I represent our logistics management practice. Uh, we support Oracle Transportation Management, Global Trade Management, and Warehouse Management here at Inspirage. That's all we, we're, we're an Oracle shop and uh, we're all about Oracle. So again, I represent our logistics uh, group. So today, um, today's topic in our video is of course logistics and specifically OTM and the mode rail. Very important topic for us today. And I have a special guest from Oracle. His name is Al Drummond. Al is a principal product manager with, uh, or, out of the Oracle development team. And um, I'm happy to have Al join us today. So uh, Al, good morning. Thanks for joining. Yes. Thank you, Ty. Good morning to you and good morning to our audience. Yeah. Hey, Al, just to get started, why don't you um, introduce yourself, uh, you know, provide your background, and then we'll jump into some specific rail questions. Sure. Okay. Um, I've been in the rail industry for about 40 years, um, working with Conrail to start with. And um, when double stack containers were first starting at Conrail, I've had a series of, um, of jobs at Conrail in the engineering department, doing design of facilities, et cetera, and in marketing uh, with unit trains. And um, at the end of Conrail, I was the planning manager for um, how the unit trains were actually done as a profit center and not as a cost center. And I was also the fleet manager for 17,000 hopper cars. So Al, how many years in the rail, like focused on rail? Well, for Conrail, I worked for 15 years. And 15 then years okay. after Conrail, I went to work for a uh, chemical company that makes um, plastic and PVC, similar right. to the one that uh, caught fire in Ohio. I handled that product. <laughs> and when there were wrecks, I was the one that got call called. So uh, very, very familiar with rail operations. And that was yeah. my background at Conrail was operations more so than the marketing part. Perfect. And what year did you join uh, G-Log? Very, um, very much at the beginning uh, at 2000, 2000. So um, I've been there for 23 years. Yeah. So Al, you and I worked together at G-Log and we were lucky to, lucky to have you then and, and now. So uh, you and I were at G-Log together. And then, I, of course, I did Oracle 15 years and you were um, very supportive of me and the sales opportunity. So I appreciate all that. So, Hey, let's just jump into some, uh, let's just, let's jump into some rail questions. So, uh, OTM vision for rail. Uh, what are your thoughts? Okay, sure. Well, OTM's vision is, is that OTM serves, serves all modes. It's not a necessary evil. It, it's really a, a benefit. The fact that you can actually have all modes underneath a, a platform. Um, the value is that for one client um, or for any of our clients, there's one platform where you're able to monitor everything. And that uh, is certainly uh, extremely important that you don't have to have different platforms for different modes. And the validation for that is, is that we already have a number of clients who are doing exactly just yeah. that. So that leads into what, what is really unique about rail? Well, <clears throat> unlike highways, the railroads actually own and maintain their own facilities to go across the country. So let's think of it as like a private road. Mm -hmm. Rail is also a green mode with a smaller carbon footprint than you would find with truck. Now, barge is even greener, but it's limited to the navigable waterways. Um, so rail offers a, a very good opportunity to be ecologically uh, sensitive to um, the transportation industry, which is a very important fact for certain customers who want to show that. Mm -hmm. So that's that's extremely important point. Um, rail provides the ability for shippers and consignees to effectively and competitively reach beyond their borders. What means is that for finished goods and raw materials, you can actually source materials further than could come in by truck, and you can ship your goods to customers further than truck, 
and still be competitive with other other of your competitors that may be closer to the customer. So rail offers that. Um, and of course, where there's a barge that's moving, no, the rail's not going to compete with the barge. Uh, rail is also a clear winner over truck in terms of it, um, of it being economical. So there's that hierarchy there that you have to remember. And that's one of the reasons why um, customers will cite their plants that are transportation sensitive to um, be able to take advantage of this. Um, rail trips are much longer than truck, mm -hmm. hence there's a need for tracking. And rail is also asset centric. So when you conceive of most uh, rail shipments, it's not a one-off shipment, it's just a pipeline. And that means that somebody has to provide the assets for that particular pipeline. You know, that kind of leads in the, I had this question written down, um, Al, you know, again, you and I started at G-Log in 2000, maybe 1999, but you and I are there 2000. And one of the special things about OTM is that it was built from the ground up uh, to handle multi-modes, right? Truckload, LTL, parcel, air, ocean, and of course, rail, right from the ground up. So I think you might have covered a little bit of this, but why is rail different from other modes? Is is there anything else there that you can share? When you think about a um, multi-stop truck shipment, the truck goes from the source to the destination and all along its trip, you will be adding freight on or off. And those, we call them ship units. Um, in rail, it's different. Um, the equipment and the freight go from one source to one destination. And the overall conveyance of a train um, would take that there. So, um, and it's the same thing for barge and ocean, when you think about it. The, um, <clears throat> the case is that um, you, w when you're not dealing with a train load of material, you can more or less model it in the same way as a two-stop truck shipment. It, it's pretty much the same. But we've had a customer, especially in Europe, where they actually have block trains, and OTM is expected to plan um, moving uh, like blocks of 30 or 40 cars from a source to a particular destination. The train continues on and drops off another 30 and then finishes up a destination. And that's completely different philosophy. And we do have that data model that's capable of handling that. Okay, that's great. Thank you. So that, that leads me into, and, and you and I have chatted about this in the past, intermodal freight, right? That seems to be, I'm working on a few opportunities myself where intermodal is, uh, is um, key. What are your thoughts about intermodal freight today? Yeah, um, most people think of rail when they're stuck at the crossing and watch an endless train of boxcars and hopper cars and stuff. When is this thing going to pass? It's driving along so slow and stuff like that. And I've got places to go. Um yeah, we do have trains that are just like that in the loose car business and unit car business and move bulk materials. But guess what? Most of the consumer goods that you buy come in containers and they come from overseas. And people can have seen pictures of ships where um, there's many, many containers on there. And of course, the very large ships have a, an enormous number of containers. They can only go to certain ports. And everybody's read in the news that there's port congestion. And one of the problems was there's not, not enough rail capacity to take the um, containers out of the port. So they say rail. Oh, OK. Well, in order to be able to economically move those containers um, from a foreign country like China to a place in the middle of the United States, you cannot sail the boat to Kansas no matter how hard you try. So it's got to go off on the West Coast and go on a train. And the train provides the economics for that. So intermodal is considered multi-segment, multimodal. And um, there are two basic ways that people handle that. One is the way I call black box intermodal, which means it's a door-to-door -door rate. 
and the person who's paying for the freight gets an all-inclusive rate from a factory in China to a delivery point in Kansas. Okay, that's perfectly fine, but there's somebody else that needs to do all those details. And so while OTM does have customers who um, have door-to-door rates, we also have customers who do all the individual pieces of it and put that together. And so our, our requirements are very simple, is, is that we have to support all types of shippers and logistics service providers. Mm. That's perfect. Yeah, thanks for that. That's a, that's a good education for myself as well. So another, uh, another topic that's pretty popular these days is uh, visibility, right? Rail visibility, any mode visibility, but specifically for rail. Um, can you share, share your, um, your thoughts there? Oh, absolutely. From the very, very, very beginning of OTM or G-Log or GC3, there was always the ability to bring in events. <clears throat> and events are the way that a um, carrier will provide um, a, an update as to where the location is of the equipment. And so um, when you have a mode that takes a long time to um, transit, the tracking events become more significant. And um, we've worked with a client who is a railroad, um, has taken full advantage of all of OTM's capabilities to take in tracking events for intermodal equipment and to update the ETA. And not only for ocean moves, to inland points, but for the domestic moves where there's a typically a drayage leg and a rail leg and another drayage delivery leg, that you want to be able to receive events at all points along that and be able to then update when that final container will be delivered to the customer. And so I say a container, um, for the most part, intermodal is the either containers on flat cars and, and the well cars are considered flat cars mm -hmm. um, or trailers on flat cars and they have the wheels. Now, what we know is, is that it's impossible to stack two trailers with wheels on top of each other. Uh, so you have containers and um, the railroads spent an enormous amount of money to clear their lines under bridges and tunnels and wires and everything else to, uh, I believe, 22 foot clearance so that we could handle two um, high cube containers that are double stacked on top of each other. That makes a very economical train um, to move that. Mm -hmm. And so OTM, regardless of whether or not uh, we're, deal we're tracking a flat car with containers on it, or a hopper car or a unit train or whatever it is, <clears throat> still takes the events. And one of the things that we need to point out is that OTM has been very, very instrumental in the industry to work with partners to provide transparency so that these events could be um, obtained and obtained real time. And the value proposition is that somebody who has a TMS can look in their TMS and see real-time updates as where the assets are, and that allows them to use that TMS to manage their freight, not just watch it go by, but to manage it and to mm -hmm. make business decisions. That's the value of a TMS. Yeah, that's perfect. All right, now I have one more for you. Uh, we, um, and, and we, rating, right? When we covered this on our, Inspirage Rail Roundtable uh, last month, and you were part of it, so we appreciate your support there. But we talk about rail rating and uh, with you know uh, equipment and Rule Eleven. Um, what are your thoughts on 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 the on this topic to wrap it up? Yeah, okay. Everybody thinks it's a trick question. Do you do Rule Eleven? <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Okay, fine. No, well, it's a big deal. And sometimes there have been discussions which go on for half an hour about Rule 11. Sure, we do it. We have to do it. We've done it for a long time. Um, and in fact, I would think that since we did it, our competitors learned how we did it and they do it too. So, you know, be that as it may, 
Rule 11 is not very hard. It's just the fact is that there's multiple carriers along a chain and each one to do their own billing. And we've got that pretty well nailed down uh, very, uh, very well. Um, now, the other thing about rail, which is odd, is, is that for the most part, containers come in four different sizes. Uh, trucks come in a, a few varieties of sizes and people rate them by the equipment gid or the equipment ID, the type of it. It's a 53 foot or a 48 foot or whatever the case is. Mm -hmm. In rail, there are so many different types of equipment. And so we rate by attributes. And for argument's sake is that when you have a covered hopper car, you can have a C1 car, which is a gravity discharge car and a C6 car, which is a pneumatic uh, unloading car. And so when you have a tariff or a contract from a railroad, they will specify which car type it applies to, and they will do it by attribute. They're not going to say it's a GID because, they, you know, railroads don't understand our OTM GIDs. They understand what they call cars with, with certain car type and classification. And there's a four alphanumeric for that. So anyway, and then they also rate the, by the different sizes so that you could have a hopper um, of 4,000, three to 4,000 cubic feet, five or four to 5,000 and five to 6,000 cubic feet, all with different rates. Railroads are very opportunistic on their rating and they're not going to let freight go by to fill a car uh, where they could charge more money for it. And so they're going to rate by those attributes and we handle all that stuff. Uh, it's just not as very familiar, but people do. And then to conclude about the assets. Okay. Somebody who uh, uses the railroad for their assets has to put in uh, an order ahead of time. And the railroads do have a system by which you order equipment and you have to have a forecast in order to do that. So, Give me so many boxcars uh, today, tomorrow, the next day. It's, it's usually for like two weeks in advance. Mm -hmm. But customers who actually own their equipment have a different problem. They have to buy it. And th what they do with, the with that is, is that they have to figure out how long it takes to serve a customer. And this is the concept of a pipeline, that how long it takes to go move their loaded how long does the customer hold on to the car for unloading? How long does it take to come back? And how long does it sit at my plant while it's inbound and it has to be cleaned and then reloaded and stuff? And so that's a cycle time. And then they can figure out with a mathematical calculation as to how many assets they need to use to make a business commitment for a pipeline for a customer. And then there's one little last piece about that. It's called demerge or detention. Mm -hmm. It's that sometimes customers sit on cars for a long time, and sometimes it's done by purpose because the railroads um, used to deliver to the end customers, and the big business in railroads these days is becoming the remarketing themselves as 3PLs, and so they're selling offline. So they have yards where hopper cars and tank cars sit and they're transloaded to trucks. And so they're portable storage facilities at those locations. Now, the same thing happens at customer locations. And so part of the logistics business is to know how much inventory that you have in the pipeline that's coming to a location and how much is at the pipe at the location and it's not just in cars because nobody consumes a carload of something. They consume so many metric tons or gallons or whatever the case that's, that's in it. So part of the thing is the visibility. And the other part is the demerge. How much do you charge a customer for holding a car longer than you've given them as an allowance? And OTM has this unique capability to do buy and sell. And so when a railroad car is at your location because it's brought in raw materials and it's sitting there, you're paying so much per day for that call per dime. And if your car is sitting at a customer, you want to charge that customer for sitting on it too long too. And that's per dime as well. And you can call it demerge, detention, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And that's and be able to charge for it. And the TMS is able to do the, the cost accumulation and the billing.
for that. And that sort of uh, wraps things up here. Yeah, that's perfect, Al. That was that, that was um, tremendous real education. Thank you. There's, there's so much to it. Um, I was just thinking, I think you have a future in rail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we all do. We all do. Hey, for those who are watching, if you want to learn more about um, the rail mode and OTM and the specifics, please reach out to your Oracle sales rep. Uh, they'll pull in Al for these conversations. They'll pull in myself and the Inspirage team. We're here to help for those to, who want to learn more. So Al, thank you for your time this morning. We appreciate it. Um, and again, uh, we're lucky to have you and uh, we look forward to the next conversation. So we'll, we'll talk soon. Thank you, Al. All right. Thanks. Always happy to help.